Thank you so much for joining us today. We surrounded you guys with the Black Farmers panel right here. I'm gonna let them get started and take it from there. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Good morning. Thank you. Do you like this? Yeah. Hello? Hello? Oh, wow. That's really close. Okay. Good morning. Thank you so much for being here on this beautiful Sunday morning. Um, we gather at the Martha's Vineyard African American Film Festival today to honor the legacy of Black farmers. Their resilience and strength is the inspiration for our work. Thank you to the film festival team for having us and to Food and Farm Communications Fund for sponsoring this tent for our organizations. As we come together today, we want to acknowledge the power that lies in unity. It is through the strength of our collective voices and actions that we can empower and uplift those who have dedicated their lives to cultivating the land and nourishing our souls. So our accomplished panelists today are representing diverse roles across the food system. And we're gonna delve deep into the impact of black farmers on our lives. I'm excited to introduce uh, the panelists. So here we have Melanie Allen, who is the co-executive director at Black Farmer Fund. Uh, she's passionate about pushing forward efforts that create a future where black farmers and residents take control of the food system. Melanie studied ag and natural resources at University of Delaware and completed her master's in sustainable international development at Brandeis University. We also have Kenya Crummel, who is the director of the Black Land and Power Initiative at the National Black Food and Justice Alliance, which is a coalition of organizations working together to build institutions focused on food sovereignty and land justice. Prior to joining the Alliance, Ms. Crummel spent 25 years working in the community development field, implementing and managing programs that build the capacity of different organizations across the US. We also have Dr. Reverend Heber Brown III, who has been a catalyst for personal transformation and social change for more than 20 years. For nearly 14 years, he served as pastor of Pleasant Hope Baptist Church in Baltimore, Maryland. So we might go to church today as well. We will. <laughs> he later launched the Black Church Food Security Network, which advances food security and food sovereignty by co-creating Black food ecosystems anchored by Black congregations in partnership with Black farmers and others. And last but not least, we have Jalal Sabor. Jalal is the co-founder and executive director of Freedom Food Alliance and Sweet Freedom Farm. The Freedom Food Alliance is a collective of small, rural, and urban farmers, organizers, incarcerated people, and their families that use food as an organizing tool to address food sovereignty, prison abolition, and economic justice. Sweet Freedom Farm conducts farm education, produces the most amazing maple syrup I've ever had in my life, grains, vegetables, and herbs in the Hudson Valley in New York. Sweet Freedom Farm prioritizes getting food to people affected by mass incarceration and food apartheid, as well as training the next generation of BIPOC farmers. So we're gonna cue the first uh, video clip, and I'll ask my first question. What does community wealth building mean to your organization, and why is it important for black agricultural businesses? I think for me, it's um, it's definitely based on land and land access, and how we use our resources that we have. Some folks have land access, some folks don't. And so how do we spread that wealth? I think for us, we're trying to figure out how we can get investments into the land. And so our farm, we just were able to purchase our land um, through an investment. Um, we have a model called steward ownership models. And so that's a model where anyone can invest in the land. And so it doesn't have to be all on us to like try to buy into the land or, or the government. We can have communities that can buy into the land similar to like there's community land trusts, there's cooperative ownerships. The steward land model is a model that we're using where, you know, if you have the wealth, then you can invest in black farmers in that way. So trying to build more models that folks that have the resources can invest in making sure that black farmers can have access to land is one way we can do that. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. 
for, for Black Farmer Fund. So we're a nonprofit organization and also a community-led investment fund. So first and foremost, when I think of community wealth building, I think of community members investing in each other, with each other, and thinking about capital beyond financial capital, but thinking about social capital, thinking about our legacy on the land, and thinking about our ancestral capital that all really informs Black folks and our relationship with, with our food system. And when we think about our food system and land, our, our history started way before slavery. So how do we reclaim and shift that narrative and think about our historic ways of sea sharing, our historic ways of healing, and just the power that we all have to shape and define our food system is, is how we think about community wealth building. Well, happy Sunday, everybody. Welcome to church. It's like, no, <laughs> I, I will say uh, that for us, for the Black Church Food Security Network, I really, in this moment, feel spotlight on the word community. Uh, that's where our wealth is, in community. So many times when I talk to elders in our member congregations, many of them tell me, yeah, my family owns land down in Carolina, or owns land in Virginia or Georgia. And oftentimes, families will struggle to figure out what to do with that land. Well, these dynamic people can give you some insight and resources. But one of the things that I strive to do is to help these families see that our wealth, our power, and resource also is found in us figuring that out together. I think uh, as a way to challenge notions of wealth in this country that focus on the individual, we have a chance to really redefine, I love what you said, Mel, redefine and challenge and change this idea of not just individual, me, myself, and I, but collectively. And if your family, if the Jones and the Smiths and the Browns and the Johnsons have the same dynamic that they're trying to figure out with their family land, why don't the families sit at the table together, learn from each other, and figure out how to tap into the wealth that comes out of that social capital and out of those relationships as well. And so for the Black Church Food Security Network, we celebrate the fact that our people, our families, and our congregations already have wealth, and that wealth can be recognized even more if we come together. And with the, is this on yeah. Um, the National Black Food and Justice Alliance, we're, we're a coalition of 50 organizations, more than 50 organizations across the country, and, and we really focus on self-determination as, as our end, end product, right? So how can we dismantle all the weapons that have been formed against us in terms of uh, exploitation and extractive means of accessing the resources that these farmers and landowners need to sustain their businesses, and, so how, and what resources can we provide to them? Um, so we're building our own institution, you know, uh, in terms of lending money, as well as Black Farmer Fund, but, um, and, and really supporting them and hearing them and working collectively and, and deciding um, together in a, in a democratic fashion how to collectively attain self-determination. I appreciate all the different ways that you all illustrated the same concept. I want to go down the line again and talk give the audience maybe one specific example of how your organization shifts the focus from financial wealth to recognizing and valuing other valuable resources within the community. I mean, I think we, we're talking about the land, but we're growing food on the land, and that's super valuable for a lot of folks that don't have access to it. Like, we're growing these heirloom tomatoes, and you can see our garlic in the back. It's like, really good food, really high nutrition, dense food that people don't have access to. So once we have that land, now we can make sure that everyone gets fed, you know? And so through mutual aid, through other ways, um, through nonprofits donating that, that extra food that we can actually give to people that don't have access to it on a normal basis is a way to actually spread the wealth. And I'll touch upon shifting power. Um, our organization facilitates an investment committee of 10 different black food actors that are responsible for making decisions around other black food actors seeking funding. And there's so much power in that lived experience. And there's also a lot of learning that happens because when we think about historically, black folks have always been making decisions together. We have historic ways of 
pooling together resources, collective economics. So how do we also learn from elders and recognize that the organization might be fairly new, but what we're trying to build and create comes from a long legacy of black folks doing this already. So, so really focusing on putting that power in the hands of black food actors themselves is, is really instrumental to our investment process. Uh, can I see the hands of those who grew up in somebody's church or who still go to church today? It's Sunday. Let's go ahead. Where you at? Baptist, AME, AME Zion, Church of God in Christ. For a lot of us who grew up in church, we recognize that the assets of the church sit largely unutilized or underutilized Monday through Saturday. We're talking about land, kitchens, classrooms, vans, a whole treasure trove of assets that are not being utilized to engage the needs of the congregation or the community at its fullest capacity. So the Black Church Food Security Network works with congregations to grow food on that land. You already own the land, grow food on it. So we help them do that by starting gardens on their land, raised bed gardens and chicken coops. And we even launched two orchards this year in Florida. And so we're trying to show churches that there are ways that you can use what you already have to address the shared and common challenges in your congregation, but also in your neighborhood. Last thing I'll say is also food is one of the highest line items on a church budget. Uh, we eat for everything. Uh, somebody's born, we eat. Somebody dies, we eat. Food is always in the picture. And what we work with churches to do is to buy in bulk from black farmers. We tell bishops and pastors, there's no reason in the world Y'all should be buying collard greens from these big box stores when they have black farmers everywhere with collard greens and sweet potatoes. you got to establish those relationships. And so sometimes, as a people pollinator, I'm like a matchmaker. And I bring the farmers and the churches together so that not just individual members can buy from black farmers, but also the church as an institution can prioritize buying from and supporting black farmers in the course of its own ministry throughout the year. Mm -hmm. And the word that, that Reverend Hebert just used, um, relationships, that's what's really important in our work. So, you know, traditional lending institutions will go through and they want a certain amount of collateral and, and checking your credit and what's in your bank account already. And our, our relationships with the borrowers that we're working with are, are really, are, are, they're relational, it's not transactional. So we know that an applicant, we know what an applicant may be doing in the community, may be a part of a trade, a work trade circle, or maybe donating food from their farm, or being a, is a, an, an active leader in their community, but may not be the best grant proposal writer. But we know them, and we know their good work, and we know that they're a part of our network, and they're not going to disappear after we lend them this, this, this money so that they can get this work done. So it's really about changing, um, start, not starting from what, what, is, what is, you know, I don't want to name a bank, a traditional bank doing, but what can we do in, in a different way, in a non-extractive way to support our farmers? Yeah. I just want to add two things. I just thinking about the point around community, I think it's really big for us and like farmers, we live in a rural area in upstate New York. So it's isolating. So we need y'all to come through and help us out thinking about like, what are those big ticket items that we, um, we that cost a lot on the farm is like labor. And so when we can have some folks come, that helps us not pay as, pay as much for labor. And then also what we do is like sharing resources, like equipment. And so that's a big, that's another big cost for us to the farm is like, who has a tractor? Who has other equipment that we can use? How do we share that equipment so it's not like costing us to like buy our own new tractor, but like how do we share a community with our equipment? So those are the two things that help us. Yeah, the equipment is really expensive. Mm -hmm. yeah. We're gonna cue the next clip. How does your organization provide holistic support? Um, you know, we had a farmer in there talking about trellising tomatoes. How are you all trellising? Uh, black farmers, helping them thrive, helping them keep their land, and creating lasting impact. Um, and whoever can go wants to go. go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, we're. Um, I focus on on the land, but but and 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 recovering land. And and some of you may may or may not know that the history in this country after during the Reconstruction era, 
uh, black people worked to purchase land. Yes, albeit stolen land, but purchased land up to 15 million acres. I've heard different estimates, but um, and that by the 90s, so that's 1910, 1920. So by the 90s, we were down to about 1.5 million acres. And that's not because people sold their land or didn't want it, it's because it was taken. And so we're working to secure that land again, but also training, provide training resources for um, returning generation, young people who are interested in farming, who are, and, and also educating people it's, you know the political education about uh, the, the 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 importance of and um, the pride in farming. You know, there's a lot of trauma associated with being, you know, our ancestors being enslaved or being even sharecroppers. And so, just working to dismantle that, provide the training, providing the resources, but also providing trauma. Um, uh, 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 resources to help people deal with trauma and overcome trauma from being in this space. So another way that we support black farmers is by hosting farmers markets at churches on Sundays so that right after worship, congregations come out and can support those farmers. Uh, if you know anything about church, you know that after service, everybody's hungry and we're going to go eat somewhere. And what we love doing is bringing the market right there to the church after weeks of promoting those farmers uh, through the congregation. The congregations are excited after the benediction to come out and to, to support them. And so that's our Soil to Sanctuary program, which we are grateful to host at various churches across the country. Other thing I'll say very quickly is I'm really loving this matchmaking that I get to do. Uh, I'm both preacher and a uh, novice wannabe farmer uh, and growing in as a farmer as well. And so I'm a bridge person. I'm a part of both communities. And sometimes farmer language and church language, they miss each other. And so I'm grateful to be a translator in a way and connecting congregations and farmers. And one of the things that we've done most recently is literally hold the hands of farmers and churches and have meetings on the farm between church leaders and farmers and talk about how the congregation can be a greater support to the farmer and vice versa. It's a two-way street there. And so the relationships are there, but also I think it sets the runway for us to address some of the things that show up in your family generation after generation, heart disease and cholesterol and blood pressure and the like. Um, that doesn't have to, we don't have to be comfortably saying all the time, yeah, it just runs in the family. I think we're too comfortable saying that. We have the power to interrupt that if we go to the source and the root of having greater agency. And so I love to talk about food access, but even more, I love to talk about agency and autonomy. And when I think about black farmers and black churches, you have high levels of agency and autonomy that we can tap into to a greater degree to help address some of the root causes of pain and challenge in our community and be in the driver's seat of shaping what our food environments look like. Mm, I love how you describe that connector role. We also have a connector role in the sense that we organize community work days for farmers to come to each other's land and help each other for a project like a greenhouse build that on their own it might take weeks, but having 10, 15 people that know what they're doing, it can take one to two days. So building relationships amongst the farmers is a big part of our mission around that interdependent network piece. We're also working around market distribution, so finding out what farmers are growing and what quantity, what markets they're currently accessing. So if there are a group of farmers that all want to access a more lucrative market in New York City and they're in upstate New York, what would it look like for them to share transport costs, which might be a barrier? Or if they're trying to access a wholesale distrib distributor or a supermarket, but there are certain quantity requirements they can't meet on their own, what does it look like to pull those resources together? So really seeing that holistic technical assistance coming from community and helping to facilitate those relationships is a key part of our work. And then we also have a rapid response fund, which responds to you know, urgent emergency situations that aren't as uh, predicted. So it could be a tractor breaking down, it could be loss of crops because of flooding. So being able to also have more an emerging uh, response to needs in addition to our larger funding process. Yeah, um, for us as a farm, um, yeah, or I would just say even for myself, my journey was trying to like work on large farms, but initially I was only getting paid like minimum wage. 
without including housing or anything else and trying to transition to like pay to live in New York, upstate New York, uh, on minimum wage with no housing, no health care that's like not sustainable. Um, and so now for Sweets Freedom, we make sure we pay folks like a real living wage. We include housing and health care and even like a wellness stipend. And so it's trying to be like holistic in that sense. It's like, yeah, what, what are your needs that can actually like make you into a farmer and like make you actually like thrive as you farm? Because I feel like for me, my journey was not a thriving journey at all until like, yeah, until now. So it's been important for, for me to make sure the next generation of farmers aren't going through that same thing. You bring up a really interesting point about economics. And when we were initially doing our research for Black Farmer Fund, we found that in New York State alone, um, Black farmers were making negative $906 a year and other farmers were making 42000 And that was like 2017 numbers. Um, so that's, that's a great point that you bring up about making sure that not only farmers are making an income, but they're also able to um, you know, pay themselves. And there's a, a large racial wealth gap that exists within the food system as well. So thanks for bringing that up. Okay, we're going to cue the final clip. Open it up for questions from you all. Is um, What is the long-term impact of your organization that you anticipate? And how can everyone in this audience help contribute support to that long-term impact that you want to create? So, do you want to start? Um, I, I, I have to mention uh, Fanny Lou Hamer, civil rights activist and, and founder of uh, Freedom Farms Cooperative in the Delta area of Mississippi, and in inspiring our work and our vision for what we want to attain. And, and that is ensuring, uh, uh, I'm sorry, eradicating food apartheid, right? And just making sure that folks have enough food. and. And on our way there, we have to secure this land, right? We can get back to our North Star is the 15 million acres that I mentioned earlier. And that may not happen in my lifetime, but I, I feel like I am holding the baton that, you know, is passed down from people like Fannie Lou Hamer. Um, so securing that land and... Um, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> Oh, yes. And so along that line, if you have family land that is not being used, we are, you know, helping people to put land into trust so that it it will always remain in black hands and can be um, matched with farmers. We play matchmaker as well. Right. And just but um, collectively stewarded We're you know, we're, we're also you mentioned shifting from individualism to collectivism. Right. So we're always educating folks about that. And um, we also have, you can also help by, if you go to our website at blackfoodjustice.org, we have a, a national directory of black farms and you can look for one in your area and support black farms. Thank you. Uh, Malcolm X once said that land is the basis of all independence. Yeah. And if that is true, and I believe it is, particularly in this country, then collectively black churches have to be a major player in the independence of black people because collectively black churches own more land and assets than many other institutions in our community. I'm doing this work through the black church food security network because I do not want it to be so that the last time you saw black churches working for justice was 60 years ago. I wanna give you some fresh memories, some fresh images of what it looks like when black churches get a vision beyond themselves and understand a, a liberation theology that's rooted in justice for black people in this country. So with our 250 congregations and rising across the country of all sizes, 125 black farmers, and that's rising every week as well, I really believe that the work that we are doing is in the spirit of Malcolm X, in the spirit of Dr. King, in the spirit of the black freedom struggles that we've studied in school in the 1900s. What could it feel like if we didn't have to reach so far back to see the last time that we collectively worked together for freedom in our community? 
So this is how you can help. Sure, go to our website, blackchurchpower.com, blackchurchpower.com. Sign up for our newsletter. Follow us on social media. All of that is there. But let me just speak this in the air, not just for our organization, but even for my comrades who are here and colleagues as well. I'm also praying for the Harry Belafontes of this generation. I'm praying for the Aretha Franklins of this generation, the A.G. Gastons of this generation. Who are those people? Those were entertainers and celebrities, people of great wealth and skill and genius who bent their genius in the direction of justice for their people. A.G. Gaston was the richest man in Alabama who put his money behind the civil rights movement. And though you often didn't see him on the front line getting arrested with Dr. King and them, you better believe that there would not be a movement if it had not been for A.G. Gaston's resources behind that effort. Aretha Frank Franklin, R-E-S-P-E-C-T, -E and as we was dancing on the stage, she was moving her money behind uh, justice, uh, civil rights and justice activists and organizers. And many of us know about the great newest ancestor in Harry Belafonte, who also, as he was dancing and singing, was making money and, and, and using his celebrity to put it behind those who were on the front lines. And though you often didn't see Harry Belafonte out there getting hosed down and dogs chasing him, you better believe that without his genius and resources, it would not have moved as far as it did. And so I'll say that as well. There are people here of resource, of celebrity, of standing and status, that you are sitting in a position right now that can connect with this frontline social justice movement against racism, white supremacy, and for the healing of our community. And connecting with frontline folk and putting your resource with it is going to put a battery in the back of something that Maybe our grandchildren will be reading about in books in years to come and say, no, we don't have to reach back so far. We were alive and saw black people coming together who said, listen, down with individual achievement at the, ex I'm preaching them, I feel it. Amen. 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 As I go to my seat, <laughs> let me just say, we can do better together. And if you put front line and support us behind and come together, I foresee a day at Martha's Vineyard where the food that we eat come from black farmers, where the restaurants buy from black farmers, and every meal that we enjoy when we come here, we can enjoy it that much more because we know the farmers that it came from and the support that it extended to our own community. Thank you. all Amen. Amen. That's what we all came here for. <laughs> come on. All of that. <laughs> Um, yeah, when we think of the long-term impact on our land, we think of more farmers on land owning land. We think of farmers growing food that's relevant to our communities, to our cultures. We think about across the food system, more collaboration, more, more ownership, and also about our neighborhoods that are divested by redlining, that don't have access to food. Farmers from our communities being able to, to source those communities. And, and most importantly, we think about black people being able to sustain this work. Far too long, our organizations have been dependent on white philanthropic institutions that flaky, inconsistent, change their mind all the time. And we're not going to get farther without us all being part of that community. So when I think about these calls to action, how everyone in this space can be part of this, we all have a certain access to power, privilege, access just by nature of us being together at Martha's Vineyard on a Sunday, beautiful afternoon. So think about what that, that means for you. You might be in a position of policy where you can advocate for more resources to be directed to black farmers for the money that is owed and the money that's needed to sustain them on the land. We might be working in an institutional buyer situation where you're part of the food industry. What are some internal practices or policies that might keep black farmers from being able to participate in that, in that business transaction? Maybe procurement requirements, maybe quantity requirements. Thinking about if you have a visible platform, how you can help raise awareness to some of the statistics that were shared today. On your table, you'll see cards that describe the decline of black farmers from 925,000 to under, what is it? Under 35,000. That, that number isn't because black folks don't want to be on the land. It's because of institutionalized policies that have forcibly removed them from the land. 
And then most importantly, our everyday decisions. We are all part of our food system. We all invest in the food system on a daily basis and in ourselves. So that dollar can go so much farther when you're thinking about what it means to buy your food from a black farmer, to buy your food from a black owned supermarket. So being able to just think of the different ways that you show up in the food system in an intentional way can help sustain all of our work collectively. Um, for us, uh, the future is definitely about looking back. So we're talking about Fannie Lou Hamer, that Freedom Farm Cooperative, what was actually happened that was like, that's the solution. A lot of times we just need to like look back and the solutions are there in our history. Folks were doing it like Rev is saying, like, how do we pull that forward? Like, but like what actually happened to the Freedom Farm Cooperative? Why, like, why didn't, why does it still exist? And so like trying to understand what those solutions and like, what were the challenges for those solutions that happened in the, in the past? And yeah, listening to Malcolm X, that quote is like truly inspiring to us. And uh, we, we talk a lot about like Harriet Tubman, you know, as abolition farmers, we're looking at Harriet Tubman as like the top abolitionist. But Harriet Tubman, she has a home in Auburn, New York, right? Where she rested, that's a prison town. Auburn, New York is a huge prison town. So how do we really honor our ancestors, Harriet Tubman, um, when her home is in a prison town? So we're talking about Grow Food Not Prisons as a farmer. Um, how do we shift the economics that are going to putting us in prison to actually feeding us? I think that's, a, that's our way. Like, how do we actually shift those economics? And like Mel is saying, if you have those political capital, how do we build that movement on like shifting that? Like, we know our tax dollars are going towards putting us in prison. How do we shift our tax dollars towards actually feeding our communities? Like, how do we shift our tax dollars to actually going towards something that's going to benefit our communities. So like, if it's political capital, if, if it's name recognition, like how do we all make that shift as a movement? So yeah, that's our call to action. You can also buy our garlic and syrup, yeah. check us out. Just, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. Oh, Rissen has a mic or microphone for you. Thank you. Um, my mother is from South Carolina and her family had uh, 70 to 100 acres of property. And it's still in the family, but my question is, that it, and it's, you know, my grandparents died without a will. And in so many cases, especially in the South, there were people that were self-sustained, right? They had farms, they had land, they were owners of their own property, but because of lack of record keeping right. and lack of having a will, yeah. all of that land is just being lost. So are you connected in any way with you know, legal organizations that can help protect people's land, mm -hmm. um, especially in the South? Because yeah. like I said, there are just acres and acres and acres of land that is literally being given back to the states. Yes, absolutely. Heirs property is, is a significant issue. Um, Land Loss Prevention Project is in North Carolina. There's an heirs, there's an organization that focuses on black heirs property in South Carolina. I have to get it and I'll give you the name, the name. But um, we, we're um, committed to helping people um, clear title on that land. We provide for our members and, and we're opening it up. We're, this is something we're um, in the beginning stages of. Um, but um, clearing title, putting the land into trust so that it's not lost. And, and you, you, I have family land in South Carolina and we're in the same position. It's easy for people to just forget, to, to lose track of paying the taxes, all these little things that can be avoided. Um, so yes, that's a, um, I will get you the name of the organization in South Carolina. Oh, yes, and on the table, yes, it says 10 ways to save your property. Grab one of those, and there's a whole, that's by Land Loss Prevention Project. On the right behind you, ma'am. Yeah, in the corner. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And there's plenty of those. If anybody else has an issue, there's plenty of those booklets in the back. My name is Irene Johnson Hamlin. I was born in Aiken, South Carolina. I just had two aunts who 
passed and didn't have a will. So my brothers, they were trying to get the land for people. But um, most of them died before me. Mm -hmm. And um, I uh, had to get myself a lawyer. There was 32 heirs, 37 heirs. Mm -hmm. And I just closed the deal last October past. And um, yeah. one, one way of keeping your land is to go to the tax office and register it as farm or timberland. Mm -hmm. You get a cheaper rate, a much cheaper rate. You get 40, 50 acres of land for about $58. Mm -hmm. so Thank my you. I was a farmer county, county agent in Princess Anne's Maryland. And I guess that's how he ground out about, you know, going to the tax office and registering your land. It's timber or farmland, and you will pay less taxes on your land. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Conservation easements right. definitely help alleviate financial constraints. Hello, good morning. Um, had a couple quick questions. One, um, I had heard, you know, just kind of through social media, there was one particular pastor. Uh, when we talk about you doing the, um, uh, the uh, market, farm markets outside of the church, um, I guess they were planning to probably grow weed on their land. And so in this particular aspect, would have been more advantageous because trying to draw young men, young women in from the streets to be able to learn how to grow some type of uh, greenery that they could also section out a good portion of their land to show them how to grow foods and fruits and, and other types of things that'll be more sustainable to their, uh, to their family. Um, the other one I was hearing about Monsanto, so now this is just another thing that I've been hearing uh, with, the, uh, with the seeds and the particular process of the seeds, hearing that even down to the, the seed that they can manipulate the seed to specifically affect certain people and certain cultures in a negative way, um, how do we get out of not having to go to them for seeds and because I know that there have been some illegal things that you can't buy seeds from other people. You have to buy them from, from that particular company. Um, how, how does some of those things work, too, as well? And then, um, sorry, one more thing. Um, in, say, for instance, uh, churches are able to have farms. Do they have uh, people to maybe come to their church to say, let's show you how to begin the development and putting those things into practice? Sure, I'll touch on some of that, and I'm sure my colleagues have things to say about uh, the seed side of that as well. So in terms of, uh, yes, that moment, that viral moment of growing weed on church land, uh, I saw that too. And, um, you know, I think there's something to be said about the ways in which um, the quote-unquote war on drugs was a war on black people. And now that it is lucrative uh, for folks to sell cannabis, um, you know, there's a whole lot of unpacking and sitting with that that we have to do to unlearn and heal from some of the things that we have been taught since the 1960s, 1970s or the like. But I'll say this. It's going to be some time for many of the churches that we work with for the deacon board to sign off on growing cannabis on church lane. But there's no uh, there's no barring growing collard greens on church land and in carrots. And I would like to show and share with younger people that growing that is just as lucrative, if not more so. Uh, and this is not me having an anti-cannabis message. I think that's a very important conversation too. But I think, the, uh, so to speak, the, the lower hanging fruit, so to speak, is to start with the stuff that's gonna hit more tables in black America. And those staple foods are, are those that's gonna hit more tables. And I think on the other side of that, uh, on the churches you talked about, it was seeds, there was one other thing you said, you added to it. Maybe Jalal can answer but the seed question. Uh, there was another church. Uh, oh, oh, yes, yes. We, we do support. Yeah, we work with churches. So we don't just propose the idea to churches to grow food. Once the church signs off on saying, yes, we'll start a garden on our land or an orchard. Uh, we come alongside and work with that congregation to set it up, to maintain it, to learn and grow with it and connect with other churches. And so. We're not an organization that likes to have churches do things in a silo. We really are preaching to churches that we can only get out of this hole if we work together. And so we bring the, church, the, the food growing churches together in community to learn from each other and all this great wisdom and history and background 
They need to know that too, because we don't grow food as some hobby, as, as Dr. A, uh, Ash, uh, my dear sister. And so we do work with churches on that front too. On seed saving, Jalal has, has a piece, but I'll just say we do work with churches on seed saving too, and mason jars, and the whole, the whole process of that as well. I would just say, yeah, it's super important. Like, we can't grow food without the seed. The seed in the soil is kind of like the basis. There's a bunch of uh, seed growing organizations that we can connect you with. There's True Love Seed, Sister Grows. There's a lot of farmers that are, are growing their own seed. And so for us, we have our own seed in the back, too. And so that's really the basis for us is, like, we have our own corn seed. And so we're able to, like, continually save that seed and grow for the next season. So... Yeah, we'll just try to connect you with a list of like growers that are not connected to Monsanto's um, or any other like chemical. Johnny's. Yeah. Johnny's. Seed. Johnny's is good. There's Fedco. There's a bunch of lists, but I think if you look up Black Seed Seed Savers, um, they're more trusted as like good seeds to like buy from. I don't know, Riston, if you want to add to that, any other seed companies. I mean, in the Hudson Valley, we're doing Hudson Valley Seed Company. And also, you can save your own seeds. So if you want to talk to us about how to do that or get some resources on how to start your own garden, save your own seed, that's also you know, in, your, in your power. I think we have time for one more question behind you, Riskin. First, let me thank you all for what you are doing for black farmers and for all of us today. Thank you so much for what you're sharing. And on behalf of my ancestors, my grandparents, Ida and Piston Brady from Mariana, Arkansas, who gifted us with vision, 164 acres of land to 13 children, grandchildren, and great-great-grandchildren all along the way, I just pay homage. I wanted to ask some questions along the line of the timberland and swampland um, concern. This, these acres that I just mentioned, only a portion of it is farmable and needs wells. The rest are, is the timberland and some of the swamp, swamp land that limits our ability to earn off the land, if you will. So I just wanted to know if there's funding opportunities that you know of that could support our family in identifying ways to make better use of this land. Yeah, I think, I, I think yeah, I think I was talking to you earlier about just like how each state is kind of different. There might be different funding opportunities depending on your state. But most states have um, conservation easements. And so for our land, the land that is like wooded and that we can't actually grow in, you can get a conservation easement that you will get actual tax credit. So they will get, you'll get off on your taxes from that land that you actually can't grow on. If you can't figure out a way to grow on the wetland, um, yeah, look into other easements, but definitely like a conservation easement is possible. Um, I would can you also uh, Kim take a look at the National Forest Service as well in terms of maintenance and care of the timber on your land I know there's a, a lot of funding that I'm hearing about through individuals and congregations that are tapping into resources for the care and upkeep of the forest whether urban forests or more rural on their land as well. So that might be a place also to check out too. Obviously they got the most money. A lot of people here on the island don't even know that this qualifies as a rural community. Um, the problem is it's really hard. It's really hard to get through their paperwork. It's really hard to get through but, you know, whether it's on off farm labor housing, whether it's resources to. So are there organizations or do you guys facilitate helping the small individual farmers to just get to get their applications to the people in a form that's, you know, that will work? Because it seems to me just sort of getting to those places is sometimes the hardest because, you know, it's it's a lot. A lot of folks that we work with, members of our organization, are not fans of USDA. <laughs> so they're not, yeah, so um, they're not interested in submitting an application there. But we do provide support with with proposals if necessary, and and I know other organizations that do that as well. So I could. Oh, because they have a tremendous racist history. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, one of the inspirations behind starting Black Farmer Fund was in response to the USDA continuing to fail black farmers, but we've also facilitated organic mentorship between farmers in our community that have gone through some of these grant applications to help other farmers. Um, so for example, in New York, there's a program to get a hoop house and all you have to do is like apply for it, be able to prove that I think for like three years, you've been able to steward that land and make a certain amount, but then you get an entire hoop house like delivered to you and it's like reimbursable. So there's like some, you know, policies and guidelines within that, but we have farmers that have gone through that that have supported other farmers in that in that program. And then we also facilitate virtual and in-person skill shares around specific topics. So USDA grants has been one of those priority topics that some folks have expressed interest in learning more about. Yeah, they're, they're supposed to help you actually with those grants. Like USDA is supposed to have a representative or your state might have a representative or Cornell Cooperative might have someone that's supposed to help you. We got help from the, uh, the National Young Farmers Coalition. Um, but yeah, they will help with grant writing and ideally help with like reporting. I think that's like the hard, that's like the next jump is like once you actually get the grant, you have to report and that's like a, another harder piece. And so finding an organization like the Young Farmers or the National Black Food Coalition to like actually support with the grant writing and the reporting. I would say on the ride here, uh, Riston heard me on the call with a farmer back in Maryland who was saying, man, there's so much money. The USDA is giving up money. We can go, you should go get that money. And, and I'm pumping brakes. I mean, I think sometimes in particular circles like the groups here, um, the USDA is like pumpkin pie at the family reunion. Uh, it's on the table, but ain't nobody rushing to it if sweet potatoes available. So, so uh, the, the hundred year history of the USDA cheating black farmers, I mean, those stats that, that Kenya shared earlier, um, one of the major reasons as to why black farmers don't have as much land today as we used to is because of the discriminatory, discriminatory practices of the USDA and the ways in which that money has big, heavy strings on it that if you take it, you got to stay on top of it because it could result in the loss of what you have because you didn't keep up with their requirements. And so I respect if black farmers, uh, and many do, go that route of getting resources from the USDA or if landowners want to do that, I would just say be very uh, mindful about going in as an individual. We got to recognize the power dynamics that are at play here, right? And so there's this huge government agency has tremendous power. And if uh, I go in as an individual, no matter how charismatic I am, the power dynamics mm -hmm. is gonna put me at a disadvantage before I pull off the lot. Mm -hmm. And so I would say, and I'm a big fan of black farmer collectives, or if there were uh, black landowners, families coming together in a collective to go through the process together, mm -hmm. hear from people who have already gone through getting USDA funds and what the pitfalls were, so that you are prepared uh, before you even go too far down the line with the USDA. And in advance of that, there are so many other funding opportunities that are there and that you know Black Farmer Fund and National Black Food and Justice Alliance and others know about uh, that, and even family foundations that I think could be a better starting point for those who are newer to the process of trying to garner funds for their land owning or their farming operations and just to kind of grow the capacity to manage that, uh, be, maybe before jumping into the deep end of the pool and getting like a million dollar grant from the USDA or a loan or whatever from the USDA. So we are, we're almost coming to a close here today. Um, if you have any further questions for the panel, feel free to come up to them after. But I just wanted to close us out and just thank you all so much for being a part of this panel. Um, thank you for your involvement, and we just encourage you to learn more about the organization. We'll have some individuals to be at the tables at the back, as um, Jalal alluded to. We have some garlic, um, some, we have tote bags, we have merch. Um, on the tables, we have, we've supported different black businesses and have tea blends on the tables for you to take. There's also tea giveaway tea, tea blends on the back table as well, so please make sure you take those. Those are from um, two urban farmers in New Haven, Connecticut. And um, yeah, that's, that's all. I guess my last sentence that I'm gonna say is together we can sow seeds of change and foster a more equitable future for black farmers in our community. Thank you so much.